Good morning, Carleton students and family and other students and other families. Uh, this is Mr. Drake and I have another story to share with you today. Um, I've been working this morning on online learning. Um, so I've been doing some problems, doing watching some videos on my computer and taking some notes here because we're trying to get ready for this distance learning this that we're starting off um, in earnest next week. So I've been doing that, but now I'm going to take a little recess and um, share a book with you. And so I want to take my Carlton shirt off here. Um, and I've got this special tie that goes along with the book I'm reading today. Um, and in fact, at the end of the book, I'm going to ask you why you think this I wore this tie, how this will go with the book today. Oh, I'm also going to take my slippers off, show you my wonderful Michigan socks I have on today to get comfortable. I hope you're taking recesses and taking a break from the work you're doing at school. Um, the book I'm going to share with you today is Pink and Say by Patricia Polanco. She's one of our famous Michigan authors. She also writes and illustrates the book. And it's a book that is kind of longer and pretty serious um, and touching. It's about a time in our country in the 1850s when we had the Great Civil War. And there was a lot of stress and pain in our country. And we're going through a lot of pain and stress right now. But I'm hoping that you'll enjoy this book as I read it to you. So let me move it up here and get a closer view of it for you all. And again, it's by Patricia Polacco. She is a famous author from Michigan. And this book is special because it was given to me by my mother for my 35th birthday just a few years ago in 2000 and she says it's a story for all races and she kind of introduced me to Patricia Polacco with this book this is also a book that was signed I got signed by Patricia Polacco see if I can get this worked out so the book stays open so she signed it to me as well which was very special and this book is written in memory of Pincus A. Lee And here we go, Pink and Say. When Sheldon Russell Curtis told this story to his daughter, Rosa, she kept every word in her heart and was to retell it many times over her long lifetime. Sheldon had been injured in a fierce battle and was left for dead in a muddy, blood-soaked pasture somewhere in Georgia. He was a mere lad of 15. He lay there for two days by his reckoning, only to slip into unconsciousness and fever. He was rescued from this field by another lad who had also been separated from his company. I will tell it in his words, as nearly as I can. I watched the sun edge toward the center of the sky above me. I was hurt real bad. For almost a year I'd been in this man's war, the war between the states. Being just a lad, I was wishing I was home. My leg burned and was angry from a lead ball that was lodged in it just above the knee. I felt sleepy and everything would go black. Then I'd wake up again. I wanted to go back to our farm in Ohio. And sometimes, when I'd fall into one of them strange sleeps, I'd be there with my ma tasting bacon powder biscuits fresh out of her wood stove. Then I heard a voice. For a moment I thought I was fever dreaming, but then I felt strong hands touch my brow, splash water on my face. Being here, boy, means you gotta be dead, the voice said as he gave me a drink from his kit. Where you hit? Because if it's a belly hit, I got to leave you here, he said. I had never seen a man like him so close before. His skin was the color of polished mahogany. He was flying union colors like me. My age, maybe. His voice was soothing and his help was good. Hitting the leg, I told him. Not bad if it don't go green. Can you put weight on it, he asked, as he pulled me to my feet. We got to keep moving. If we, to stay, if we stay in one spot, marauders will find us. They're riding drag and looking for wounded. 
Next thing I remembered was collapsing in a heap on the ground and rocking with the pain in my leg. Everything started to go black. Then I remember him pulling me up on his back. I heard him say, Lord have mercy, child. You as bad off as I am. I'll tote you. I can't rightly leave you here. I remember being pulled and carried and stumbling. I remember hard branches snapping back in my face and mouths full of dirt as we hit the ground to keep from being seen. I remember slogging through streams, hauling up small bluffs and belly crawling through dry fields. I remember these things in half sleep-like, but I do remember being carried for a powerful long way. And then this just has a picture. No words on this page. Then the fever must have took me good, because I could feel a cool, sweet-smelling quilt next to my face. Soft, gentle, warm hands were stroking my head with a cool, wet rag cloth. Look at that morning that's coming, a woman's voice said as she spooned oat porridge into me. Do your mama know what a beautiful baby boy she has? Where am I? Is this heaven? I asked. She tossed her head and laughed. No, child. Pincus brung you home to me. Don't you remember? The mahogany child, I thought. Both you children been on the run for days, and a miracle of God Almighty brung you both here. Yes, indeed, child, a miracle. I remember thinking, could this war have been so close to this lad's home? I couldn't imagine having a war right in his backyard. I looked over and saw him a-looking out the window light. Guess you don't remember much, he said. I'm Pincus A. Lee. Fought with the 48th colored. Found you after I got lost from my company. My name is Sheldon. Sheldon Curtis, I said weakly. This is my mother, sweet Momo Bay, he said as she smiled at me. Lord, Lord, I never thought I'd see my dear boy again, she said as she hugged him. I've been getting along, though, Pincus. Warm things got left in the big house when the family left. Dry goods, too. The rest I've been getting from the woods. There's a freshwater spring. Still have some chickens. Even got an old cow out that still gives. Then you have been here all, all alone? Pincus asked his mother. Where is everybody? Your daddy runned off to fight a month ago. All the hands and their children runned off out of harm's way, but I stayed. I prayed to the Lord every day. My prayers were surely answered because he brought my baby back here to stay, she said as her face beamed. You ain't never going to leave your mama again, are you, child? She said softly. Pincus looked troubled and didn't answer. I'm going down to the stream and pound these clothes of yours, she said as she ready to leave us. If you hear marauders coming, get for the root cellar door. Stay down there till they gone. That's what I've been a doing. Marauders here? Pinka said with alarm. They've seen there's nothing here for them, child. Nothing. As soon as she left, Pincus stank to my bedside. Sheldon boy, he whispered, as soon as you healed up, we got to get away from here. We're a putting Momo Bay in a great danger by being here. If they come and find she's been holding troops, then his voice trailed off. We got to get back to our outfits if we can find them. You mean back to the war? I asked. I must have gone pale as he went on to say, it's the only way, ain't it? Then he looked at me. Sheldon, you all right? You look bothered, he said as he eased me back. You can call me Say, I said. Everybody in my family calls me Say, not Sheldon. I expect you're my family now. Near enough, Say, near enough, he said as he chucked the blanket under my feet. You can call me Pink, he said softly as he smiled. For the next week, Momo Bay fed us both up good. Raw milk and cornbread never tasted so good in all my born days. It was the first time in months my vittles didn't have any mealyworms in it. She saw to it that I tried to walk a little every day, so's that mean-looking leg don't go stiff on you and cripple up, she'd say. 
This place wasn't that much different from our farmhouse in Ohio. More poor, maybe. But it smelled the same, like pine boards and good cooking, a mess of beans with salt pork, cornbread, greens, and onions. When we slept, she sat near us, stoked the fire, and watched over us. Never thought I'd feel safe enough to sleep deep again. My mother and Kalo, my father, jumped the broom on this very spot, Pink said, as we walked, as he walked me on my first day outdoors. And that there was the master's house, Master A. Lee, Pink spoke quietly as he helped me along. How come you have his last name, I asked. Boy, when you owned, you ain't got no name of your own. Even Kalo had to take that name. As we rested under the willow tree, Pink asked me about my family back home. Got one brother still at home to help run the place for Pa, I answered. What was your outfit again, Pink asked. He'd asked me before. Ohio 24th, I carried the staff. One supposed to carry a gun, but then so many died even us boys had to carry after so many were slaughtered like hogs. At least you got to carry. In the 48th, we couldn't have guns at first. We fought with sticks and hammers and sledges. Can you imagine not trusting us with our own fight? I couldn't imagine such a thing. Then, when they did finally give us muskets, they were from the Mexican-American War. Those muskets jammed and misfired. Then how in God's name can you want to go back, I asked. Because it's my fight, say. Ain't it yours too? If we don't fight, then who will? I had no answer for him. But God forgive me, I didn't ever want to go back. After a few more days, I could walk a little steadier, but still needed help. Pink took me by the big house and walked me through it. Weren't much left of it, really. It was mostly burned out. Master A. Lee had a library full of books right here, he said. He taught me to read, even though it was against the law. He must have been a good man, I said. More bad than good, say. Sometimes I think he just liked being read to. There was this book of poetry, say. That was this, that was this thick. Every night I'd read out loud to him from that book. I blessed this house because of all those beautiful books, but I cursed it, too, for what it stood for. We walked a bit further. To be born a slave is a heap of trouble, say, but after Ailey taught me to read, even though he owned my person, I knew that nobody ever could really own me. You feel hot, Pink, I said. Lord, I think you are as sick as me. Let me fetch you back to the house. I'll be fine, boy. Just a little tired, that's all. I'll be ready to fight, though. I'll be ready to fight. That night after we ate, Momo Bay came back to the table with a worn old Bible. She was so happy. My heart ached at the thought of telling her we'd be leaving soon. Master A. Lee showed him how paper talks. Show him pink, she said. He took out a pair of spectacles from his pocket and opened the Bible to the Psalms of David and started to read. His voice was steady and had such wonder. Just hearing them words made pictures come into my head. I surely do wish I could read, I announced to them without thinking. When Pink saw how ashamed I was, he took my hand. I'll teach you, say. Some one day, I'll teach you. I could feel my face flushing up. Then I spoke up. I done something important, I announced. Of course you have, child. Of course you have, his mother said. I touched Mr. Lincoln's hand. It were near Washington. We were quartered there just before Bull Run. The president himself were shaking everyone's hands, and I just put up my hand right out. And he took it? Pink asked. Yep, he took it, I answered. Now there's a sign, ain't it? He said, smiling broadly. Touch my hand, Pink. Now you can say you touched the hand that shook the hand of Abraham Lincoln. Next best thing to touching him, Momo Bay said in wonder. Most of the next day, Pink was a studying an old map. Marauders don't fan out further than 30 miles or so from their camps. If they come here, then their units must be that close. We got to get south of the river. Stay here, say. Say, see here, say. That's where my troops were headed. We can meet up with them about, about here, I figure. Meet up with who? You ain't leaving. His mother's voice caught as she came upon us. Now, my mother, you knew we couldn't stay here. You had to know that, 
he said as he tried to calm her. No, no, my babies, my dear babies, she cried. She was inconsolable for a time, and then she sat still and feared as she just listened. Mother, this war has to be won, or this sickness that has taken this land will never stop. Pink always called slavery this sickness when we talked. We have to go, he knelt at her feet. By the look that came into her eyes, she'd known this day was a-coming. I could feel my breathing catch. My chest was heavy. My hands were sweat, and I felt sick at my stomach. I knew that I had to tell Pink something. I just didn't know how. That night I couldn't sleep. What's wrong, child? Mo Mo Bay said from her chair. I don't want to go back, I blurted out. I know, child, she said. Of course you don't. You don't understand. I took up and run away from my unit. I was hit when I was running. I sobbed so hard my ribs hurt. I'm a coward and a deserter. She looked at the fire and said nothing for the longest time. Then her voice covered my cries. You ain't nothing of the kind. You a child. A child, of course you're scared. Ain't nobody that ain't. I'm not brave like Pink. I'm not brave. Child, being brave don't mean you ain't afeard. Don't you know that? I don't want to die. There's things worse than death, child. But you got nothing to fear. You are here now and I'm a-hugging you up. You're going to be an old man someday. When it is your time, the sweet Lord will send a hummingbird down to fly your soul to heaven. Now you ain't afeard of hummingbirds, are you? Her words brought me sweet sleep. That night I dreamt of hummingbirds and green pastures full of sunlight and wildflowers. The next morning we mustered to leave. We packed cornbread, salt, pork, and dried beans. I would have done just about anything to stay, but my place was to go with Pink. I owed him that. Just as we were making the last sweep of the place, making sure there were no signs of us ever being there, we heard wild screams and shrieks coming from the woods. Marauders! Pink said as he grabbed a piece of wood for a club. Momo Bay took it from him. Get to the root cellar. They ain't got no truck with an old dark woman. You get to that cellar, you hear? We didn't like it, but then she pushed us. Hurry, before they're here. She lifted the root cellar door and shoved us in. Don't come out till I tell you. We heard the porch steps creak as she ran from the cabin. She's drawn them off, Pink whispered. When the marauders came in, my heart was pounding so hard I was sure they could hear it up there above us. There was a terrible commotion as they ransacked, looking for food. Then there was silence. A single shot echoed through the wood trees outside. They let out a war whoop as they thundered off. We waited for a sign from Momo Bay, but it didn't come. Finally, we climbed out and ran outside only to see Momo Bay lying just beyond the porch. We put you in their way, stay in here, Pink cried as he rocked her in his arms. Her eyes were looking in a faraway place as he closed them. Your son loves you, Momo Bay, your son loves you, he sobbed as he kissed her. We both held her hand until there was no more warmth in it. After we buried her under the willow tree, we set out. Pink fingered we were three days' walk from the Union's troops. He watched the movement of the sun. Her words still rang in my heart, her words about being brave. My steps were sure now, as they'd ever been since the war started. We walked in the open as clear as a country stroll until the morning of the second day. Then we knew we were being followed. Take these, Pink said as he took his spectacles from his pocket. If they catch me with them, there'll be trouble for sure. When they caught up to us, one yelled at me, Where are you going with that darky boy? I was afraid to answer because my northern of my northern accent. It would dead sure give us away. Boy, what outfit you part of? The leader barked. I couldn't answer. You union boy? One jeered as he pulled my uniform from my knapsack. No, no, I ain't no Yankee. I got that from a dead one. I sputtered, trying to convince them. That was when we were grabbed. My words had given us away. 
We were prisoners of the Confederate Army. We were held up in a barn that night. Pink shivered with fever. I held him as he'd done for me. The next morning, we were thrown into a boxcar. We rode for what seemed two days, stopping many times. When the door slid open, the daylight was blinding. We were loaded into a buckboard and taken through town. The townsfolk looked hard at us. All they had left for us was mean looks and a heap of hate. We jarred to a stop in front of gates that marked the entrance to a stockade. It says Andersonville, Pink whispered. My heart stopped. I had heard of this place. It was one of the worst Confederate camps. When we were pulled from the buckboard, we fell hard to the ground. No, no, I begged as they pulled us along. Because of his fever, Pink stumbled and fell. They dragged him along with such meanness. He did not protest until they forced us in different directions. Then he reached for me and he said, Let me touch the hand that touched Mr. Lincoln, say, just one last time. I watched tears fill his eyes, and I cleaved my hand to his until they wrenched us apart. They smote him and dragged him away from me. He looked back at me and tried to say something more, but they crossed his back with knotted hemp and pushed him along. Sheldon Russell Curtis was released from Andersonville Prison some months later, weighing no more than 78 pounds. Andersonville was built to hold only 10,000 prisoners, but by the end of the war it held 33,000 soldiers. There was no fresh water, no shelter, and no food. 13,000 men and boys died of starvation and dysentery. Sheldon Curtis returned to his home and recovered. He settled in Berlin Township in Saranac, Michigan. He married Abigail N. Barnard and fathered seven children. He became a grandfather and a great-grandfather during his long lifetime. He died a very old man in 1924. Pincus A. Lee never returned home. For him, there was to be no wife, no children, nor grandchildren to remember him. It was told that he was hanged within hours after he was taken into Andersonville. His body was thrown into a lime pit. I know this story to be true because Sheldon Russell Curtis told his daughter Rosa. Rosa Curtis Stowell told it to her daughter, Estella. Estella Stowell Barber, in turn, told it to her son, William. He then told me, his daughter, Patricia. When my father finished this story, he put out his hand and said, This is the hand that has touched the hand that has touched the hand that shook the hand of Abraham Lincoln. This book serves as a written memory of Pincus A. Lee, since there are no living descendants to do this for him. When you read this, before you put this book down, <clears throat> say his name out loud and vow to remember him always. Pincus A. Lee So that's a story of Pink and Say, written by Patricia Polacco and illustrated by Patricia Polacco. And I hope you enjoyed it and maybe can have a little discussion with those you have listened to this book with about um, what it meant to you. Also, if you think about it, think about why I chose to wear this tie in reading this book.